and focused on making and creating adequate impact. She's unapologetically a feminist and a constitutionalist. She fearlessly and courageously takes on corporations and governments when it comes to protecting rights of people. She's helped shape and redefine legislation, especially around gender justice and freedom of speech in India. Please welcome the very dynamic Karuna Nandi. Hi Karuna, good evening. Hello and thank you for having me. Thank you for agreeing. Thank for the usual you know, very intensely cerebral webinar. I'm just so pleased to be on a relaxed Sunday chat. Thank you. And we're, so <laughs> glad. we're so glad to see that lawyers have that side to them and they're willing to display it. So thank you. Please meet with Vikas, my friend and colleague. He's, he's going to take over from here. Vikas, over to you. Great. Hi, Karuna. Hi, Vikas. Great. And uh, hopefully it won't be too relaxed because Denisha runs the interrogation like a, you know, a real cracks whip with that, so hopefully it'll be less relaxed later on. Well, I suppose we've got to be on the other side sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, um, so this, this kind of whole journey we do with Unsuited is really to look at the uh, kind of personal journeys you know, lawyers have you know, in their career and, and what got them to even you know, start in their careers you know, as lawyers. Um, and with yourself, you know, your parents gave up bright careers at Harvard Medical School and the LSE in London to come back to India. And your mother you know, set up the very first Bastet Society for Children as well in North India. Um, and your own journey has been uncannily similar where you worked with the UN to re before returning to work at the Supreme Court, focusing on constitutional law, commercial, media, and tech law. So how did the kind of choices that your parents made when you were younger influence you, you know, and your journey, you know, from to return and becoming a lawyer here? You know, I saw that uh, giving up money and at that time academic um, recognition, because, you know, my father was at Mass General, which was the Harvard Medical School Hospital, and my mother got the History Prize at the LSE. So giving up academic re recognition, giving up money, giving up, you know, comfort, brought them so much happiness, you know, in the sense that it, not the giving up of it, but what they got from where they came. So my father came back to Ames to, because that's the, that was the top public hospital at the time. And that's where all sorts of people could come. I mean, of course, ministers would call. And if a minister would call, then uh, he would say that I'm not going to see you. Right? Really? <laughs> All sorts of trouble, yeah. And if there was some VIP who came, and VIPs also went to Ames at that time, even now they go to Ames quite often, right? But they would stand in line and they would wait. Like, and the poor person who came first would be seen first. So wow. I just, you know, I mean, they got penalized left, right, and center for it, but they were happy. And um, that's, and I was born here, you know, and the sense of purpose. And the reward that they got from it was just so evident that it was it, it was vital, I thought, for me to find a vocation, you know? Mm. And, um, you know, I think uh, work is like love, that you find it, either you find it or you don't. It's, it's just a sense, of, it's, a, it's luck. And so I dated a lot of careers. <laughs> 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 I uh, uh, I kissed a lot of frogs. I was uh, my first uh, internship was in feminist publishing. Um, actually, everything gave something to me. I don't want to I don't want to downgrade any of that because it was all quite rewarding. It just wasn't my home, you know. Um, and then I was in uh, um, I did a, uh, some social work. I did a donkey survey, you know, <laughs> as to the sort of problems of donkeys and mines. I mean, this was all in college. Uh, I acted and I was a, a sort of decent actor or a barely competent actor at my very best. I was just barely competent, you know, so it was blatantly not my thing. I, um, you know what, that's probably not even a bad thing in today. If you watch Bollywood, then uh, you're probably as good as some of them. You know, I have a lot of even, respect for some of Bollywood now. Like they some of them, really yeah. Work, right? You also uh, did this. And then I became a TV journalist. And then I, you know, and then I applied to film school, law school, journalism school. I had an economics degree. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I walked into class 
uh, in law school and there was this you know the, uh, the first day had a bunch of really really cool professors so um, I've told the story before of Janet O'Sullivan who was really pregnant when she was sort of teaching us taught the first day right and just hilarious like she would just the way she lit up your mind I mean she would just have funny stories about taught and it would make sense and you would remember stuff right and then the same day we had Graham Burgo who taught us the difference between assault and battery so he took a ball and he threw it this is this is English law uh, this was in Cambridge right so he threw a, he pretended to throw a ball and the first row is a bit like whoa and that was in English law assault whereas if the ball hit the person then that is battery right an incredibly simple way to illustrate an idea that in words can get a little more complex so honestly I was taught by a sort of old white imperialist constitutional law and I got a first in constitutional law but and you know my my uh, closest friend in that class was uh, uh, the daughter of the former president of Cyprus and we used to make fun of him all the time but of course not to his face and we used to ask difficult questions right and um, it was, you know, it really lit up my mind. I'm not saying that imperialists should teach law, but what I'm saying is that despite. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But then what, what drove you to come back then? Because I, I see your parents, you know, gave up their careers and that, and you said you finally found kind of, uh, you finally found a date you were happy with, you know, when you got into, you know, law school. So then what made you run away from that? And well, not run away, what made you say, you know, I want to come back to India and, and practice that. Yeah, because I'm going to interject here. You also worked with the UN, right, Karuna? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that must have been a very, very fulfilling experience. But you chose to sort of transition back to India, like Vikas was saying, move away from that um, and, and do this. So why? What, what, what really happened there? I had been away for six years then. I had a New York bar um, qualification. I was working at the UN. I was getting paid lots of money, tax-free. I was very impressed with myself. And, you know, you told people in New York what you did. They were very impressed with you. I was sitting in this tall building. And then at some point, I really felt that there was so much human rights work to be done in India, you know? And also I felt that there were lots of different reasons. Uh, I also felt that there was a lot of room I felt to contribute just also a general lawyer because I represent a lot of companies. You know, I just don't represent companies that I feel conflicts with, right? Um, I mean, something has to fund the human rights work, right? <laughs> and, uh, I, and I also read an article by Harsh Mandar about the Gujarat riots. And... I was just, you know, I was thinking, how can this happen in my country? And I really felt the call. And I am uh, very unashamedly patriotic. I really love this country. And I'm of this land. And I, the culture and people, and I speak, you know, my, uh, language it's not just it's not just the Indian languages I speak it's not just the Bengali and the Hindi right it's also the English is Indian yeah. so this, this this love and of course I also feel connected to the human rights violations in Rwanda that were happening at the, uh, around that time right like the genocide in Rwanda and I feel like it is all our responsibility you know this idea of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam the, the world is one family um, I think that's really important and I am a deep internationalist, but at the same time, the world is divided into, for better or for worse, into sovereign nations, right? And the site for the claiming of rights is primarily national. So yes, international law is something that is important, is something that um, I think I'm a great believer in, I think needs to be strengthened. I also think it cannot be victor's justice, you know? It can't be. It can't be U.S. justice, for example. And I mean, we're seeing that particularly now. The ridiculousness of that. Right? Um, but uh, but it can't be victor's justice. And there's a huge critique of you know international criminal law as victor's justice. So I think there are a lot of problems there that need to be fixed. But 
I still very much believe in it. And I feel that that is one of the important sides of my work, that and comparative law, you know, working with other jurisdictions, uh, for example, on the high level panel for media freedom and on the uh, Columbia uh, global panel for free speech. What we're doing is we're looking at different jurisdictions, but we're primarily not looking at international law, right? Like we're pr primarily looking at different jurisdictions uh, uh, and how in national jurisdictions and national courts rights are claimed and how rights can be claimed. Of course, where there is a, a, a international court or international forum where this can be effective, sure, absolutely, nothing like it. But that is not common. So, so, so you're saying it was the uh, kind of. You know? And you're saying that the trigger for that was the Gujarat riots in 1993? and what you were reading about it, you know, when you were overseas. That, that was the kind of trigger that what you were. It was one of the triggers. I moved back for many different reasons, but it was one of the major triggers, yeah. And I moved back and I worked um, uh, as an OSD, an officer on special duty to um, uh, the National Human Rights Commission. That was the only organization at the time was doing anything about it. It was headed by the former uh, Chief Justice of India, Justice Verma. And I wrote to him and I said, you know, can I come and work with you? And he wrote back and he said, sure, <laughs> you know. So... So that was a great, that was a great start. And I also started my um, litigation work at about the same time. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, even talking about, you know, your this concept of internationalism, nationalism, and you, know, you have a kind of feeling for humans everywhere, right? And I think you've said in a TED talk that humans are wired to be connected and to be empathetic. Um, and balancing, the human rights side and corporate side, it's very easy. And, you know, we can kind of have a stereotype that lawyers seem to have shelved that instinct to be connected, humane, empathetic. So how do you manage to maintain that humane and empathetic side? And especially in today's environment, which is increasingly polarized and cynical. You know, because I think it's very important for us to be integrated for our minds to be integrated with our hearts, to be integrated with our spirits. And these are all sort of artificial words in a sense. It's still a whole person, right? Which is why I only represent cases that I can absolutely fight for. Of course, some of the issues that I represent are extremely emotive. So when you're representing a, a, a rape victim or when you're representing one of the Bhopal cases or when you're representing, you know, somebody who's been thrown in jail for a joke, something as stupid as that, um, I think initially when I was, uh, I've now been in the law for 19 years, right? So, uh, when I started, I think I worked very hard on the rational side and was very clear about leaving the rest of me outside the court. And so there was the, uh, Kuruna Nandi litigator inside court. And I would never have had this conversation, for example, you know. And then there was the me outside court. And these were two di entirely different categories. And like there was no, uh, um, there was the twain met inside me, but not, not in um, how I presented a case or how I interacted personally. Well, how I interacted personally, it did, it did come in. I was arguing an excise tax case once and... Um, got really obsessed with it and talked about it at parties. So, you know, that didn't go so well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the private side, like the, the heart, the spirit didn't, didn't, didn't come into the courtroom. Now, I think I got a lot more confidence as I grew older and that rational legal side got much more developed and strengthened. And I was able to, I think, then become a lot more comfortable with bringing the rest of my whole self in, you know? The fact that I am uh, a feeling person, right? Um, communicating that to the judge, because I think that judges, that constitutional courts should care about rights. Of course they should care about rights, right? Um, I also think that being a woman in court is an incredibly important perspective. It isn't there nearly enough that being a feminist woman in court is an incredibly important perspective, right? Um, 
not just a feminist woman, a feminist person in court. Like Justice Chandra Chur um, uh, identifies as a feminist and he cited Catherine McKinnon in the Puttaswamy judgment in the nine judges. And it takes, you know, it takes guts to do that. She's a dominant feminist, right? Um, but what he said was just so clear in terms of intimate decision-making and the decision-making of the body. And this is where the right to privacy is so fundamental. And so when I take that Puttaswamy judgment and I take it to the high court to argue that marital rape should be criminalized, right? Then I am attempting to bring the perspective of millions and millions and millions of women into the courtroom. And millions, I'm not kidding, millions of women who are raped every week. Right? So I think that bringing that whole self into the courtroom is very important. And, I, and which is why I think so many of us speak of different, you know, kinds of people, of, you know, Dalit women and disabled women. I've never seen a disabled woman, a woman in court, you know, or at least an apparently disabled woman. Um, Muslim women, different kinds of, uh, Muslim, there are more Muslim women, I think, than, but they, they possibly upper caste Muslim women. But, you know, a, a wide variety, a wide spectrum of people in court. Because, uh, of course, at the moment, for example, we're really worried about the coronavirus and how it will impact judges because most of the judges are over, almost all the judges are over 60 and men, right? Yes. So we're very worried about them. And it, this kind of brings into sharp relief the fact that this is true. So, it's really high time that we, we diversify. Mm. What, what was the, again, what was the tipping point? Because you said when you were younger, you were much more rational and probably uh, operating from IQ. And then you said as you grew older, more of the kind of EQ side came in, which is interesting because we were chatting to Zia Modi last week. and She said exactly the same thing, that when you're a young she, lawyer, she, it's right. exactly the same, that it's all about IQ. But when you get older, it's important that the balance shifts towards EQ and that becomes a much more important facet of being a great lawyer because the IQ is there anyway but then EQ is something you develop so what was the kind of moment that you saw that you were transitioning to having the kind of comfort and confidence to bring your whole self you know, to the law and to the court? You know because as a woman litigator um, you can't let up on the IQ like you've got to keep building on it. You've got to keep learning. You've got to stay sharper than, than your competition. You have to be as sharp as you can be because you have to be better than the other person. If you're the same as the other person, it's not going to work. You have to be better than the other person, right? It shouldn't be the case and it's sad, but it is. Um, how did it become, um, I mean, how did that transition happen? I think it was a process. I think it was a process. I think once I got comfortable and I wasn't trying to, and once I understood the rules, see, once you understand the rules, you can play with the rules, right? And once yeah. you, um, uh, and I think I also realized that the rules weren't made for me. The rules were made for people with families in the law, with inherited practices, um, you know, basically for upper caste straight Hindu men, right? So at some point I figured that, of course, I was going to, of course, I was going to play by the rules in order to sort of have a killer instinct and a, the bullseye is to win the case, right? But I wasn't going to play by the rules as to how to get there. Yeah. Okay. That's a good line. We, we, should, we should note that down. It's a good one. Mm. I'm not going to play by the rules <laughs> to, to get there. Very powerful, Karuna. And I think, I think your point's even more pertinent today. So as well as the kind of, you know, what's going on with going in lockdown and inequalities, but, you know, the kind of whole Black Lives Matter movement that's spreading around the world, which brings into kind of perspective the um, amount of injustice and the patriarchal structures we have in place that make it very unfair for a lot of people. Um, so I, I want to skip to a slightly different point before we get back onto the kind of you know, inequalities in greater detail. But um, 
you're you're very active on social media right? and you you know and that is not an easy medium to choose in a country like india right and i mean on a personal level i used to be you know do my rants on twitter quite a lot and then i just about two years ago i just gave up said you know what i do not want to be expressing my opinions in a country like this because you get so much nonsense out there and it's a waste of time debating so i just kind of like you know what it's better not to do that on social media but you still do and you're very active so what do you see as some of the kind of downsides um of being on social media especially given you know you don't shy away from hiding your opinions you know you're very frank about you know taking you know, the bull by the horns even on social so what, what do you see as the kind of downsides of that uh I think there's a lot of aggression and there's a lot of aggression against women who voice opinions, right? There, uh, there are le there's less aggression against me because I'm a lawyer, but it was still there to a degree. But I literally, I... You're on mute, Karuna. Uh, I think your phone's gone off on mute. Just have to unmute yourself, please. Thank yeah. you. I, I think, Kriti, you just, you just got hacked because we started talking about social media and uh, <laughs> the trolls. Yeah, let's go with that story. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, uh, I just literally, I blocked the whole IT cell. Literally. <laughs> like, and be a, and block, and block. I just block. It, it was, and the thing is that, look, I also do tech policy, right? Like I advise tech companies. And I am absolutely clear that the onus shouldn't be on the user to block. But the option is there. So I exercise the option. And of course, uh, I got, uh, and people would say, but what about free speech? I'm sorry, free speech doesn't mean you have the right to my mind space or my, uh, or, you know, my years or my consciousness. You absolutely do not. You can, I'm not preventing you from speaking to the rest of the world. Go nuts, say what you like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I blocked the whole lot. So I think that was, uh, that was a really good process because of course there are, sort of, uh, uh, there are some very intelligent people who are economically conservative and yeah, even socially uh, right wing who make arguments, right? And who can be engaged with. And, um, and you know, obviously those people would not be blocked. You know, I, I follow quite a lot of those people. Right? Because there's no question of not engaging with ideas. But so much of what he comes at one is not ideas. It's just, mm. you know, rubbish. Right? Mm. That just has to go. From my, so got, I'm not saying it has to go, that it, it has to be banned or it has to be silenced, but it just has to go from my consciousness. I think the other challenge these days is that the gloves are off. Yogendra Yadav was just implicated in the Delhi riots, right? It's crazy. Um, I'm representing Harsh Mandar in the Supreme Court. Um, uh, you know, I read the first article I read about the uh, Gujarat riots was by Harsh Mandar when I was sitting in that tall building at the UN. I didn't wow. know him at all. And then when I came to, uh, when I came to um, the NHRC, I met him there because Justice Verma had brought him in to advise assistance. But so in, in the contempt case, so I've represented him a couple of times in the contempt case. Now let's see how that goes forward. But he is being, he's being charge sheeted, right? And for a speech that is public. So I encourage everybody to actually watch the speech. I mean, the man in his incredibly dulcet, soft-spoken tone speaks about love and speaks about how we must be nonviolent and we must treat each other with love. And, um, that's what he talks about. And at one point he says that, yes, the courts will make the decisions, but uh, the decision will also be made on the streets, which by which he means that uh, there's a democratic consciousness that also contributes to how constitutions get realized. Right. But firstly, what happened is that only an excerpt of that was produced in court, which I think is, is crazy. That's wrong. It's so wrong. Um, but, all, but if you really see the whole speech, this, it's ridiculous that he is in a chat sheet. But this is the world we are in. So I think being on social media also brings attention to that. But honestly, I really feel that this is why we practice. This is why we train as lawyers. This is why we train as constitutionalists. Not to... 
you know, spout high polluting ideas in the easy times, but to also stand up in the tough times. There's this line, um, there's this line, I think it's from Julius Caesar, which is kill, first kill all the lawyers. And that line is very frequently misinterpreted as being anti-lawyer, but it's not. What the meaning is, was, is that they are the bastion of civil liberties. And if you kill them, if you take them down, then there is no rule of law. Wow. And so I think that in a time where Sudha Bharadwaj is in jail, and she is really, really a stellar person, quite apart, I mean, she was at MIT and she went to, I'm in Delhi enjoying a you know, comfortable enough life. She was in Chhattisgarh, assisting people who absolutely didn't have any representation. She's, she's not a Mao, I mean, she's as much a Maoist as she is a, you know, Donald Trump, frankly. Right. And she has been in jail for the longest time. So, of course, there are risks. But this is the time. This is the time that I think tests people's mettle. This is the time at which you see who shows up and who doesn't. And this is the time to stand up. Because What's the point of not living while you're alive? That's true. And that's very powerful. Thanks for that, sharing. That. Yeah, just quick. Do you, do you get that from your parents? Is that you've seen them as examples of living life to the full? That, that kind of drives you to, the, well, supports you, not drives you, but supports you today as well? My mom passed away. Um, and my father's, you know, very much around. But in terms of, I think I get it more from my father. No, both from both my parents, from both my parents. I think the idea that if you're doing the right thing, then it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that important so that the consequences are just something that you deal with and um, absorb and tolerate because you have done the right. You know? You know, speaking of, of what you said, to pick up from you know, what you said just now, Karuna, you clearly sound extremely passionate about the work you do. And not just the cases you represent, but I think uh, the, the sphere, the general sphere that you operate in is something that you're extremely aware uh, about and, and feel strongly towards. So I'm going to ask you this question. Being a constitutional and a public uh, law practitioner, I'm sure that's very different from the kind of lawyers we are used to largely, well, most of us are used to dealing with, which is the m &A guys, the corporate guys. Even on the litigation side, there's more corporate commercial dispute uh, sort of lawyers that we meet with rather than those who work in the, in the spheres that you do, right? And, and for the kind of law you practice, I'm actually very curious to ask you, how do you draw the line? You know, when, when do you sort of say that, okay, this is it, I'm not going to get involved uh, anymore. Because for the kind of law you practice, on a daily basis, I'm sure you're very invested. And also, the outcome is something that you're highly, highly attached to. Because it's, it's going to impact somebody's very basic right, perhaps, like you said, right? So how do you manage, firstly, do you manage to stay sort of neutral and, and slightly detached? And if you do it, then how do you do it? You know, Tanisha, in every case that we do uh, uh, as a chamber, whether it's a human rights case, whether it's a constitutional case, whether it's a commercial case, we put in everything, right? Everything. We work incredibly hard. And, um, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm tough, you know, on myself, on my team. And I'm very clear that we all have to bring our best games to the table, like our yeah. best games, right? Um, but, and also our killer instincts. Mm. But once you put everything in, that idea of nishkama karma, which means 
work without desire for reward mm-hmm. um the idea the philosophy is that it has to be gained that's does it all this but you know because i love winning i love winning right <laughs> <I can imagine. laughs> but but the idea is that like you put in everything and then it, you know everything in the world is not going to be up to you sure. right you you win some you lose some so you're essentially saying do what's within your control and then just sit back with a hands off approach and and see how it sort of unfolds no but do literally every oh. single thing every single thing that is under your control you know? right yeah. right but tell me like i'm just curious. every single ethical thing i mean that should be taken for granted you know <laughs> no, with, with it is in these days but it should be yeah. knowing who you are and and the reputation that precedes you i don't think you need to clarify that at all karuna the, the ethical is is an understood so but i'm actually still i'm still going to probe this a little bit and i'm still very curious so for example you're working with say a victim of Uh, for the sake of example and i'm sorry that you know i do want to work with an example so i'm going to take this one on let's say you're working with a victim in a rape case right every night that you're going to bed you you've sure you've read the law you've looked at the evidence you you know your teams put together their best foot forward but when you're going to bed that night are you thinking i really hope we can nail this one or you know like that, do you do you obsess over it a little bit is there a tendency to do that of course it? absolutely I obsess about it all the time <laughs> you do but you also but you also there see there's lots of studies to say that if you uh sleep on something then there's a way in which your brain processes and settles the idea and prioritizes what's important and what's not now this is very important in the law right because you've got like a ton of information and you have to prioritize what's important and you have to prioritize what you think is going to appeal to the judge and all of that you have to sort of structure it in like your mind has to structure it Right. um i also think it's very important to take a step back and just think about the case okay and this is i think for arguing counsel this is incredibly important because once you've read all of that information you you know all of that law and i am a great believer in due diligence so when i was younger and i was uh, i just come into the supreme court i was yeah i was in my uh, sort of mid 20s i think and i had you know I had opportunity to argue before various additional solicitors general uh, uh, etc in various but particularly tax cases somehow there were lots of tax cases okay and um i used to read every single word you know and i still try to read every single word sometimes i have to rely on um uh, chamber associates colleagues who will but i still try to read every single word for myself right um and some of my colleagues at the time used to say oh you know i only spend an hour on an slp and then i just go in and i say two words to the court and i actually think that's deeply negligent behavior because the um and i'm not making bones about that because i think that the judge could turn to page so and so and i've one cases on precisely that right and say well what about this and then the other person doesn't know and honestly and uh, obviously i'm not going to take names but when we've been up against people who we know don't read and we know don't know their stuff <laughs> this is the strategy we employ right correct that's an yeah. empowering strategy yeah i'm sure yeah understood okay that's that's insightful and and do you ever get into the righteousness of a matter like do you do you ever sit back and say hey do you think this is right or wrong do you ever sit down oh, you do oh, yeah, yeah. and but does that impact how you look at the case or how you work towards it <clears throat> you know we have this thing in my chamber where i uh, when we're preparing for the case when we're prepping for the case so we all sit together and i run my arguments by my team and if we have time then some people uh, go for and some people go against right so it's a moot court and the feminists will argue the the sort of stronger feminists will argue for the uh, rape accused Mm-hmm. and the uh, the others will argue for just for the the purpose of that exercise right mm-hmm. will argue for the complainant or the prosecution and i think that's very important as lawyers because even if i wouldn't take the case of the rape accused unless i was 100% sure you know and yeah. yeah it doesn't go by the cab rank principle but i think there are many many deep problems with the cab rank principle right um 
you've got to anticipate the arguments on the other side right and the thing is that you know particularly in human rights we see that people are so excited and swept along by the righteousness of the cause they forget to look at the law you know you can't do that you can't do that because the cause is important you can't not look at the law correct your the, the duty on you to do due diligence is that much stronger you know understood that's interesting i'm actually going to ask you another question which which uh, evaluates some aspect of emotion which is you know when we all went to law school and and this is true for me at least okay i went to glc here in bombay and i walked in saying i'm going to be you know uh, fighting for human rights at some point and then Three years of the five-year course I did, and by year three, everybody was talking about corporate internships and you know how we must uh, land ourselves internships at at least mid-sized firms, then do a little bit of due diligence, M and A, P E work. Oh, how much drafting did we manage? So we all kind of get swept away into the entire corporate side, you know, and and we're encouraged to land safe, well-paying jobs. Uh, you know, don't take too many risks. uh with your career uh don't go up against people who are you know uh influential you know this is the kind of dialogue that kind of uh, rules our decision making at the time right and for someone like you 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 uh, walked into law school you may have enjoyed the study of it then you made a conscious decision to pick up one single discipline and you've kind of stuck to it right and you no, you two. have got to So, so I had I think this is important Tanisha because I had a business model from the get go right okay. I uh, was very clear that my uh, my first degree was economics mm -hmm. I enjoy my commercial litigation a lot right okay. and it was um, that is what funds the human rights work and I always from the beginning I did both this work now and the, and the thing is that from that I also actually that was divided into a large number of other things because the human rights work is of course based constitutional work right it's part 3 of the constitution but also other constitutional work you know some election matters other constitutional work um um uh and then you know i also start, have started doing a fair bit of tech law in various aspects media um, and right media but also like the the fintech i'm currently representing there's there's a few cases on their behalf one is a competition case um um uh, i mean there are there, there's a sort of uh, there's a wide variety of areas in which i am uh, working litigation correct very rarely do you get a silo of law in which you can operate right for example like if you think of the people who are considered greats um fali nariman for example i mean he is something who says this very very specifically not to specialize because take the bhopal cases for example you have a situation where you have union carbide that was an indian company the parent is registered in um, new york the union carbide corporation and then that was taken over in the early 2000s by the dow chemical corporation which is registered in delaware right so there are various corporate bear avails to be pierced sure. there are various choice of law issues that must be navigated um plus now recently the whole caboodle has been taken over by dupont right yes. so now the thing is that if you're not comfortable with that aspect of the law and you only know your tort litigation right and so what is the human rights work here it's all of it it's the tort law it's the and there's also criminal law aspects the criminal law aspects have been taken um, care of by uh, avi singh primarily but you know i also do a lot of criminal law for example right but you have to know that if somebody is a proclaimed absconder then their assets can be attached and then how does that interact with fraud and veil piercing particularly when there is a judgment from from the federal court in connecticut saying that union carbide has specifically uh, uh evaded that order of the bhopal court where they have been declared a proclaimed absconder in order to bring their um intellectual property into the country through a, a shell company i mean through an agent basically right? right now this basically means that 
Union Carbide is under the jurisdiction of, uh, and Dow Chemicals who help them do it are under the jurisdiction, according to us, obviously. There are others who will argue the opposite. They, the uh, Carbide and Dow will argue the opposite. Um, but if you don't understand these various different aspects of the law, then how are you going to bring it together? Correct. Yeah. So this is, this is I find it interesting. I would, you know, I find it interesting. Um, so I think tax law is one area that can be to uh, an extent siloed off. But even there, you know, customs, you need to know criminal law. Understood. So you're saying it all essentially bleeds in and, and that kind of allows you to seamlessly practice either or and, and move on with, with ease in a way. Yeah. Okay, super. Thanks for sharing. Cool. Slight, slightly uh, different track now. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to another interview you did with um, AIB on a podcast, um, where you said, like, you know, we, we as human beings are constantly growing, and you know, at different times, you know, we will look at things differently. So, can you give us one example of a social issue that um, you've changed you know, your view upon, you know, over the years, you know, as you've started looking at things in a different way, you know, and why? The death penalty. I um, diverged from the people that, you know, from my peers and I thought that why should somebody not be killed if they have done something that is so heinous um, and so sort of out of the bounds of what is, you know, human. Um, and the reason I, uh, it was a journey for me to change my mind, but the reason I changed my mind was because courts very often get it wrong. And the Innocence Project in the US, for example, they, uh, for example, once they get the forensic evidence, they found that the person who was executed was uh, um, innocent. And it's not something that can be reversed. So there are cases that we have where one judge wanted to acquit two judge bench in the Supreme Court, one judge wanted to acquit, the other judge wanted to convict and the person was, you know, killed, right? Plus you see that the, uh, uh, the privileged, uh, uh, cre the creamy layer of our society, right? Never, and that, that domin dominates our uh, public life, that dominates our private life, that dominates our money, that dominates everything. Upper caste, Hindu, privileged, Savarna, straight, able-bodied men. Now you would think with all these characteristics that there'd be very few people. Actually, that's true. There are very few people, but they control everything, right? Mm. And these people are never sentenced to death. The people who are, are poor, Dalit, tribal, Muslim, disproportionately, right? Um, so I think that the idea that this is a deterrent has been so, a deterrent from rape, a deterrent from murder has been so comprehensively debunked by all sorts of evidence. In fact, there's evidence to show that it is, um, that there's a hardening effect on society, that it leads to greater violent crime. In Georgia, for instance, in the United States, because of course, criminal law in the States is state by state, right? Um, and uh, there's also federal law, but it's also state by state. Um, the death penalty was taken away and then reintroduced. And after it was reintroduced, violent crime actually went up. Of course, correlation is not causation. But there is also sort of anecdata to show that the correlation in this case was highly likely to have been causation, you know? So, I mean, this is the reason I sort of really changed my mind. And there's no, nothing like the zeal of the converted, right? You know, once you've traveled a bit. Mm. So that, that's more, uh, so your initial viewpoint on changing was more because we just can't get the justice right. So the, the kind of sentence, you know, we make too many mistakes for it to be fair, but... Um, would you think there's an alternative to that? Like, do you still agree that, you know, people that have committed heinous crimes should get punished severely? Um, or we just, or the answer is actually no now because we don't know how to deliver that fairly without too many injustices. I 
I think the carceral system has a lot of problems. Um, having represented a lot of victims in this system, I find that victims' rights aren't addressed nearly enough. You know, what does the victim want? Is the victim protected? Is the victim compensated? Um, I also think that there's a the juvenile justice model in theory, even in India, has a sort of rehabilitative, restorative justice component, and for particular types of crimes, and only when the when the victim wants it, right? Um, and I think those are things that should reshape our carceral justice system. Um, but I also think I would like to see the punishment fit the crime. I would like to see, so for example, you have, you have kids who are, you know, poor kids who have stolen something small and then are in the system for years and then become hardened criminals because then there's no other option, right? Um, Catherine Wu's book is very good on this, Behind the Beautiful Forevers. People don't realize that it's very much about also the, the, the justice system and when a poor kid commits a crime. Right. Um, of course, I also believe in I also believe in retributive punishment. But I think that we, we haven't quite gotten it right. I would like to see uh, I would like to see a rapist serve his time in jail, but really realize what he's done. You know, and serve that time and be made to understand the, the, the sort of the violence that he perpetrated and the violence that the other person suffered. And if the victim wants um, some kind of redress, some kind of acknowledgement, we don't really have the avenues to make that happen in a safe way that doesn't compromise, um, that doesn't compromise anyone, you know? So I think there's a lot of work to be done on our criminal justice yeah. system. Yeah. So until we find a better mechanism for ensuring we deliver um, the right punishment, we should better to back off than, than with such kind of heavy kind of punishment until we can do it properly. Well, I don't think we can back off any kind of punishment. I think we still have to punish because this is what we've got. Well, in terms like, of execution, like, like, you know, we should back off from, we should, from, from death penalty, we should back off until we can be 100% sure that we can deliver it in a just manner. Yeah. Um, cool. So it also kind of like moves on to the kind of point that, you know, you've spent, you've got your corporate career, which helps fund the human rights part of the, you know, your the work you do. Um, and you spent your career fighting for equality, justice. And I guess even in both avenues, like you were talking about the fintech company you're representing, and, you know, you believe in you know, what they're doing and you'll fight for that. Um, in the current environment we're in, in terms of lockdown, we're seeing an increasing level of inequality and the migrant labor issue is something that's brought that to the fore. Um, so what advice would you give to the Indian government in today's context and also in general with regards to working on bridging, you know, these large disparities, you know, in, in inequality? I think the most important thing is to not make policy only for people who look like you. Right, because policy was being made. I mean, con for example, when you saw the first lockdown and Prime Minister's speech around the first lockdown, um, he was speaking about coming onto your balcony and beating your um, yeah. plate yeah. and spoon. Yeah, don't remind me now, about that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I mean, this was blatantly clear that who is in his mind? The people with the balconies. Now think of who are the people with the balconies? We all think we're middle class. Actually, the vast, vast majority of people, um, even in the audience on this panel, if you look at the actual numbers are not middle class, are rich in Indian terms. In Indian terms, you may not feel rich because you don't have the full level of education and healthcare and basics that, that are required, but you might well be rich if you look at the curve, right? Um, 
but even out of those people, everyone doesn't have balconies, right? So frankly, you've got the people on the balconies who are sort of beating their plates. And then you've got the people who are, you know, walking, walking, walking on the streets under, um, their shoes wearing out, swollen feet in the, in the sort of blazing, blazing heat. And sometimes once they've got to the border, being turned back at huge risk of COVID without access, the same access to healthcare. And so I really think that if you don't have the people in mind that you should be serving, then you're not going to get anywhere. You're only going to serve that limited population. And I think that's just a basic. Of course, I have, mm. I have lots of things to say, but you asked yeah. me for one. So I think if I was to say one, I think, think of everyone. Think of the poorest person. You know, the Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi said, think of the face of the poorest person that you know. And I would add to that the most disadvantaged person. You know, don't just think of the poorest Brahmin that you know. Brahmin man that you know. Think of the poorest Mahar woman that you know, you know, um, and see whether this is benefiting her or not. Mm. And then that, that, would, that would apply across both the points of saying about one now in lockdown and two generally about how do we help deliver better quality across this country. I'm not sure if we'll get there anytime soon though. Um, I think, Denisha, you want to go over to your bit, which is um, slightly easing up on the kind of, otherwise we can go much heavier. Yes, yes, absolutely. So Karuna, firstly, let me take a moment to thank you for, you know, being so honest with us and for sharing so openly your thoughts, because uh, in the times that we live currently, they're radical. Let's just be very honest. And, and they're also... <laughs> So thank you for that. I mean, this is the constitution of India. This is the document, uh, you know, they, this is the social contract amongst us all, right? The fact that this mm. is radical today really says something. But yeah, I agree with you. Okay, yeah. thanks. So that was, that was very insightful and uh, so was the journey that you shared. But now we're going to move on to something even more lighter and more fun, right? So our next mm -hmm. segment is called the demonstration round, okay? okay. So uh, in this round, you're going to send, either show us something that you, uh, in terms of a skill that, that <laughs> enjoy right so maybe you sing I, we know you sing uh, you may not want to sing today which is fine which is absolutely fine but we know you sing and jazz being your favorite genre you also composed i think a song for your father on his 80th birthday is that right so if you want to read maybe not sing but maybe read a couple of lines from there you can do that you want to show us something around the house that you enjoy that you're welcome to do that okay um, i told you i wasn't going to sing but today is Father's Day yeah. and <laughs> don't expect very much at all. Not at all. You know, <laughs> practice now is all through. That's why I wasn't. Dane it, Danisha, I please don't join. <laughs> Danisha, please don't join in. I'll try not to. I'll try not to join because I don't know the lyrics. She doesn't know the song. She doesn't know the song because I composed it um, and it's not public. So, <clears throat> please go ahead. Can't wait. <laughs> When I was a girl, you were hard at work. Never complained, the roads were rough. They'd beg you to save them, too much to bear. So lightly you'd wear. Your cloak of care. You taught me to fight and leave my body on that field to reach for great heights, to fall, to bruise, not to yield. Because winners keep falling and fail till they rise again. I must quit, I learned, but losing can soften within. And then as I grew, you let me know. 
I'd be a woman who could say no. Freed me from fear, look death in the eye. Make this moment count, all else is a lie. Strong as a rock, not once did I ever doubt. My father's around, I never go without. You kept us all close with your joking ease. With all that strength, you're still such a gentle breeze. So there's more, but I'll leave that for when I can. <laughs> Start lower and hit the high notes. Oh, there is thundering applause. Unfortunately, you can't hear it because our participants are on mute, Karuna. But that... Oh, was, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. I think this is something any 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 of us will relate to, you know, when it comes to our fathers. So yeah. as I was thinking of my dad and, you know, my dad was in the Merchant Navy. So he was away most of the time. And, yeah. and the path that you said that, you know, he taught you that a girl can say no. And I think... Yes. That that it, we're, we're so fortunate, right? To to be, to have been raised by men who had the courage and conviction to raise strong women. Yes, that's very. That's luck. That's truly luck. Yeah, and also I think um, you know it's interesting that my father, my father's um, strengths, my father's positive qualities are very traditionally male, but he also raised me to be a. Uh, strong woman and to be a feminist actually you know wow wow what what do you mean by his qualities are very traditionally male give me an example please like you know if you think about the song and the strength and the provider aspect and all of that oh. and the fact that he was always at work he's my father's a surgeon okay and um, you know and i think particularly in these times it's uh, very apparent and we really value the fact that where where our doctors are sort of putting themselves at risk and going into work and and my father's, you know, he's at the moment he's fractured his knee, but otherwise he's been doing that every single day when his, some of his juniors didn't want to come in, you know? Right. Um, and, and I think that those, you know, those very traditionally male traits are so, so, oh, what traditionally male traits? Those, those traits that are thought of as traditionally male, right? You the, the, the guy who goes to Valor, work. courage. Right. You know, we want our girls and our boys to have these traits, right? It's not that we don't want our men to have these traits. Correct. So, so yeah. Lovely. He clearly injected these into his daughter. So, well <laughs> done. That really means a lot. <laughs> well done, Mr. Nandi. Please let him know. Doctor, I he's yeah, watching. I will. <laughs> Super. So, happy Father's Day to your dad, Karuna, and to, to all the fathers who are watching right now. To every single father who has been valued and who has raised their kids and loved their kids, every single father of everyone who's watching their show, happy Father's Day. Thank you. That's wonderful, Karuna. Thank you for singing. That was amazing. I would love to, to hear the rest of it maybe another time. So we're going to move on to our third segment, which is called the interrogation. Now, this is the part where you need to be, um, I can see that you're very quick witted and I can see that you think on your feet and that you have no inhibitions. So I don't need to set the rules. I'm just going to say, be yourself, Karuna, and answer these. The only rule is you have to answer them really rapidly. Okay, you can't take- But you don't have a hamper, Tanisha. What's up with that? It's lockdown time. I don't want to send some Corona wrapped in, you know, in a coffee tin to you. Okay. Okay. Fair I'll point. Safe for now, but it'll come. Something interesting will come to you once once things open up. This okay. I can promise you. From IDEX and the Grey Matter. Pakka. It'll happen. Okay. So are you? Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. No. ready. Okay. Okay. Your first question, then, Corona, <laughs> and this is making me laugh already. If Karuna Nandi woke up as a man tomorrow morning, what is the first thing she would do? Sorry, he would do. I would walk around Delhi. I would sort of walk around Delhi as not a Delhi girl and not as not a Delhi woman. You know, wow. Wow. because I've been a girl and a woman here, right? 
Correct. and uh, not have people staring at me and enjoy the sort of physicality of space nice that's a good one okay the next one then so karuna are you an introvert or an extrovert i'm an ambivert i think i get energy from quiet reflection and from people so i need both you need both but but can you do you have a button that goes on and off as per requirement does that also happen i can be an extrovert whenever i want so i can switch it on but um i i'm not nourished if i'm only with other people i need to spend time alone as well okay you know understood all right your next question you applied to law school film school and journalism school and then of course you picked law school as you've said in one of your interviews because it came through first right what do you think would have happened to karuna nandi you know had film school replied sooner uh would they have funded it if they were funding it then <laughs> assume assume they funded assume they agreed that they funded i would have been a filmmaker i can't i mean i don't know if i would have been a good filmmaker but i would have been a filmmaker i think and i think it might have lasted um wow. yeah i'm very interested in film really and i think the, and i think it really has a huge impact on people you know so for example if you know tarees i mean for and what that did for dyslexia and uh, other other the films and what they've really done for particular issues and how they've shifted minds you know yes. even a film like tanu wed's manu right hmm. where you know kangana renaud played a certain kind of character and i watched i watched it in the theater okay uh and the guys were laughing and the girls were laughing and you know the women were laughing the men were laughing everybody was laughing yes. and I think that kind of thing does shift shift minds, you know. I definitely. So I think I think I would have possibly been a filmmaker. Yeah, you would have been a film. So you'd be behind the camera, not in front of it. As I said, I'm a very average film actor. <laughs> I would have been behind. The <laughs> but but have you done like any short films or anything, you know, in in the training years and such? Is there? I any- did a bunch of plays with Yatrik with Barry John, um, oh. which is where Shah Rukh Khan started. um i did i did do a short film but i can't even remember the name now um yeah a little, little a few things little during college okay okay nice that's interesting okay so the, my next question then this is uh, i'm i'm waiting to hear this one okay ever since you i knew you're coming on the show i i wanted to ask you this can you tell us any three statements that we tend to make without even realizing how deeply embedded in patriarchy they are the legal fraternity or the fraternity of citizens frat frat refers to brothers okay what about the sisters you know okay <laughs> um a seminal work you know okay. seminal comes from semen frankly so okay. there's no need to say that right um you can say foundational work for example oh. um every single time we refer to a he and presume that it also means a she this is really rubbish yeah. that's too yeah. good that's, that's <laughs> yeah like even in school we were taught no god is he he is watching i mean right. he is watching were you taught that that's ridiculous we were taught that especially yeah. in india yeah So, so tell me you no know, in the larger indian context forget forget the legal fraternity in the larger indian context what are these statements we tend to make you you think three i've just given you three um three more please but you know i mean i think much of language is gendered right because if you are thinking as the default human being as being a man and it's all throughout your language right then that's going to inform everything else so i just think that um once you stop saying the he as the default that just sort of takes you step back so for example i stop saying um, or rather i'm uh, tra- uh, training myself to completely stop saying guys mm. like hello hi guys right. you know correct to say like the the best uh, alternative i fixed on is hi folks which is a bit folksy but Yeah, that's a bit more old school, but it's still you're right. It's it's far more gender neutral that way. Yeah. Yes. Yes. True. 
Okay, that's interesting. We can move on to the next question. Can you tell us any three books you would <laughs> recommend when someone's trying to get a grip and better understanding of what feminism is? I think Seeing Like a Feminist by Nivedita Menon. Um, I would really like the lawyers to read a critical gender theory book that, uh, not books so much, but there is, uh, there's the Feminist Judgments Project okay. where people are rewriting judgments as feminist judgments. And there's also, there's a branch in India and it's all over the world. It's very easy to find. I think it's very interesting. It'd be very interesting to read that. Mm -hmm. um, this is such an important question. That is, <laughs> take your time. I don't think it's the top three at all, but you know, I read Anjana Apachana's Listening Now. Okay. And it's about motherhood. And you know how I think motherhood is absolutely an incredibly wonderful, special thing. But I also think it's valorized a lot, you know? And I think it's important for girls to read that when they're teenagers, when they're young, because this idea of, uh, and also Jeffrey Eugenides is the marriage plot. Okay. Because there's a way in which you're trained very deeply, very, very strongly trained to okay. believe that your biggest achievement is um, marriage and kids, you know? Yes. yes. And, and it might be, I think that these can be absolutely wonderful things, but it can't be the default biggest achievement Correct. because that is where people then get into trouble. You know, right. and a lot do it for the wrong reasons, do it without sufficient power in the relationship um, and then get swallowed up by it. So and I think these two books I would recommend to um, uh, to sort of young girls to Thank read, you. and also also young men to read, so that you can also deconstruct from from these. Um, yeah, that's helpful because you're right. A lot of women do in India today, even today, attach a lot of how successful they are notionally in society, basis whether they've been married by a certain age or not, have they born children by a certain age or not. So it's very helpful that you've shared these. Uh, but it's also, see, it's not just, it, I don't think it's right to just, uh, 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 because we both did it, just to ascribe the responsibility to women. It's a responsibility as a society because there's a sort of patriarchal privilege that comes with marriage. You know? Um, marriage is also the site of a lot of violence and a lot of abuse. So that patriarchal privilege is somewhat notional. So I think kind of deconstructing out of all of that and having two people coming to a relationship in a celebratory and equal way that also includes queer people having, um, you know, marriage or civil partnerships and expanding the way in which you can relate. I think that's really important. Very well said. Thank you, Karuna. That's helpful. Okay, my next question for you is, what is your favorite social media platform and why? Because we know you're pretty active on social media. So which is your favorite one? Uh, you know, the reason that I got onto Twitter was because of the Shreya Single case. Okay. Because otherwise I was of the clear opinion that Twitter uh, slices your brain into 140 characters <laughs> each. <laughs> <laughs> um, Right. And once you're in, you can't leave. But no, it wasn't just that. The reason I stayed is because I saw the kind of impact that it can have in terms of communicating to the sort of uh, our citizenry constitutional ideas, oh. you know? And that's the reason I stayed. Um, so I think Twitter is very much, it's something I engage with, as you said, a fair bit. Um, and I think it's important. Um, but do I like it the most? No. <laughs> so you're most active there, which is okay, but it's not your favorite platform. But see, Instagram, I'll post once in a while, but everyone's so nice. I really like it. Yeah, Instagram is, everything's just very happy on Instagram. Twitter has, well, but there's bullying, apparently, you know, it's nice for us, but for younger people, there's a lot of bullying, there's a lot of uh, body shaming, there's, there's all that sort of thing also. Also, so it's yeah. just like, we shouldn't, we, we can't be blind to it, because it's nice yeah. for us. 
but i think that's any anyway, we social media at large you know it's it's got its own perils and and the impact on mental health and all of that dialogue is a whole different uh, dialogue to be had another time perhaps so so which one are you picking twitter or instagram i guess twitter you pick twitter then okay we have a winner <laughs> well done okay your toxic family member you can't get rid of you know <laughs> <laughs> your next question karuna which is the funniest hashtag you've seen of late online you know i can't i can't think Thank and there've lots of trump ones that have come up recently on on us twitter um even today actually but i can't i can't think can i tell you one i i found it really funny yeah go on hashtag married but not sorry <laughs> and i'm like what okay <laughs> so yeah there's, there's so funny stuff people come up with okay your next question then if you could eat only one meal for the rest of your life okay what would it be chapati dal sabzi chapati dal sabzi and is there a particular sabzi or any sabzi no i mean i'm all, i'm so bored of chapati dal sabzi but if i had to eat it for the rest of my life that this is all i would eat because i i couldn't actually just eat other stuff you know i couldn't eat pasta every day correct correct agreed okay super your next question what is your favorite book or and a movie of all time that you really enjoy you know i think that's a really tough question because there's so many books bring you so many different things but um But I mentioned the marriage plot by Jeffrey Eugenides, and I just thought that was really, really good. Okay. Just really, really good work and uh, eye-opening. Um, in terms of films, again, no one knew my favorite picture of all time, my favorite movie of all time. But Thappar was so good. It was just so good. It was you know? very good. I agree. Yes, yeah. Thappar was really good. Okay. your next question what is the most dangerous or daring or courageous thing you've ever done speaking and litigating in this environment it takes a lot i am sure it does okay well done moving on uh, what is your favorite childhood memory karuna walking back from swimming and my mother used to just let us do whatever we liked and like run around in the campus and she was um, i don't know if one could do it today but she was very relaxed about that walking back from swimming and my mother had made mango milkshake and i just thought that oh my god she's really the best mother in the world <laughs> <laughs> that is enduring so and yet crest <laughs> but it's true today also right any mother whipping up a mango milkshake is definitely the best mother in the world yeah i agree <laughs> okay my next question then how would 10 year old karuna react to what you do today professionally i mean i'd be blown away i was completely unambitious <laughs> really completely wow in okay. fact i had this uh, i thought that i would be in a mid size company the husband and children and some reason wearing an ill fitting pink suit i think that was the acme <laughs> of my <laughs> yes you have you have mentioned the pink suit earlier as well in one of your other oh, it was there it was just like the vision was there you know have you worn a pink suit though ever since it was a vision did you did you go ahead and fulfill that no <laughs> no no <laughs> Okay the next question then what do you do to keep fit karuna not enough um especially during lockdown has been terrible Correct. but i used to i used to walk with my dog quite a lot um and i i do floor exercises sometimes okay okay super which song instantly gets you to the dance floor like if i played it right now you'd just get up and start moving I'm not going to play. Not it. if you play it right now. But, <laughs> I promise. But a large number of songs, you know, a large number of songs will do this. Bollywood, pop, like rock, like all sorts of songs. So all sorts. So basically, you're a dancer. You'll dance. Yes. We'll keep this in mind for the next season. Okay. Sure. Okay. 
Super. The next question then, if you came with a warning label, what would yours say? Misogynist, zip up now. I know, zip, I know that, that sounds really bad. No. Misogynist. Misogynist, beware. Beware. Okay, okay. Okay, super. Uh, I hope they've all made notes and they are going to be aware if they were to meet with you. No, they are already. It's just something that I just have very little tolerance for now. I mean, I used to engage a lot more before. Hmm. But now I'm just nervous. You just, you just shut them down now, very quickly. Not shut the person down, but shut the One line, of, yeah, yeah, that uh, line, of, line of speech down. Yeah. Yeah, got it. Okay. okay, the next question then. What is the one thing you've done? You've done it, but you've sworn never to do it again. I think giving too much uh, uh, leeway and compassion to, to, to toxic behavior. To toxic behavior. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that's, that's healthy boundary setting, isn't it? And very, very important for self-preservation. I think very important for fairness, for self-preservation, for just like who you are in the world, you know? True. And who the, the way the world, you know, according to you should be. Right? Agreed. Fully. Okay. Your next question then, if you have a magic wand um, and you can change any law you like in just an instant, uh, what law would you change? The IPC. The IPC. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you too much about detailing that out for me because it's it's going to be a whole vast conversation. So it would go on for hours. <laughs> I can imagine. So, we'll, we, but good to know that it's the IPC. Okay. What has lockdown taught you about yourself? Any one thing you've learned, like something new? That I have everything I need. Beautiful. Okay. That is so good to hear. Now tell us one professional person like in, on the work front that you've met who you had a fixed opinion of, okay? And then you met this person and suddenly you were like, oh my God, I was wrong the entire time, whether positive or negative change. You don't have to name the person. You can just tell us. No, actually you uh, have to name the person. Sorry, sorry. You have to name the person. I mean, there was a senior counsel who's a, a very, a very accomplished senior counsel who's a woman and... Um, I mean, she would have seemed a bit sort of you know, cut and dried. Mm -hmm. I got to know her and she's just an absolutely lovely person. Okay. Uh, so that's just been nice. Okay, super. Do you want to name her? Sure. Rebecca Maman John. She's okay. great. Super. Thank you. Okay, the next question then. If you could teach future generations only one thing, just one, what is that one thing you would teach them? The ability to walk in someone else's shoes. Wow. Okay. Because I think that climate change and the disaster that's looming has become so much more real after this pandemic and the realities of this pandemic, right? Um, I mean, this pandemic looks like a disaster movie that you wouldn't believe could happen. And I think climate change has the same thing, bring, is bringing the same thing. Um, but I think that if we do that, then and if we understand the farmers who are going to suffer and the women in particular because of what climate change is bringing and if that means that we must consume less, you know, um, I think that can be the answer to a large number of ills. Okay, that's super. So walk in another's shoes. That's the one. Nice. And your last question, and this one is, it's got, uh, you know, it's got an ulterior motive. Who do you, now that you've gone through the entire unsuited journey for an hour and a half, who would you recommend as our guest uh, for, for another episode, maybe? Somebody. Rebecca. Another, really? Yeah. Okay. Or, you know who I would love to hear from is yeah. Justice Ruma Pal. Okay. And, and do you think yeah. that judges will be open to doing this? Are they even allowed? Do you think they'll be allowed? She's the former Supreme Court judge. Um, she hasn't done much. I mean, a lot of judges are doing interviews. Okay. Um, or Justice Lokur, maybe. 
Yes. Okay. But I would love to. I would love to hear from Justice Pal because she had such a positive impact, you know, uh, on all of us women who were in court at the time because there was a brilliant woman in a position of, uh, you know, in a recognized position of ability um, that 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 could be referred to, right? And if there are very few women, inevitably that's how it works. So she had a very positive impact for all of us. For all of you. Okay, super. Thanks for those names. And thank you for joining us today. It's been wonderful getting to know you a little better, Karuna. And I'm sure our audience... It's been so much fun. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to answer any questions. But uh, you want send them to, to me on... Uh, let's just do a few because I just don't think it's fair otherwise. You know, okay. I think a number of people want okay. to ask us. So let's just do a very, very quick run through. Okay, come on, let's do this. So, there are more than 50 questions. <laughs> it's been insane. We've never seen so many questions ever. Okay, I'm just trying to see what is. So, we treat it as a rapid fire. Pick it random, read it out, and I'll answer it. Ma'am, what is your advice to budding lawyers? Yeah. Uh, get a business model. You're an entrepreneur as much as you're a lawyer. Recognize that and uh, from the get go. Okay, sad, pragmatic, but I think this is the most important advice I can give. As a human rights professional and lawyer, uh, how do you stay motivated to keep fighting and avoid getting jaded or cynical? This is an extremely important question. And I think you have to tap into um, all sorts of things to reach that hope. Because it is true that, as Martin Luther King said, that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. However, it only will only bend towards justice if we work and push and strategize to bring it there. Um, and so for all of us to reach and dig deep within ourselves and to also link with other people who are enriched with um, visions that bring hope, is absolutely fundamental. Okay, this one's this one is pers of personal interest to me, so I'm going to ask you again, ma'am. What do you think of the think of the way forward for transgender people in a country like ours, where there's so much cultural difference and no understanding of gender? Let, let's just talk about LGBTQ at large, Karuna, and maybe some thought around that. You know, I think that uh, our movements in India, in particular, have sort of brought this very important idea of queerness. Mm. of queerness as liberating me. for people who are also cisgender and heterosexual, right? right? Um, I'm not going to elaborate on that. You'll have to look it up if you don't understand, uh, for the large audience, those who uh, don't understand it. Because the idea is that se sexuality is fluid and sex is also fluid. Because it's not that, you know, of course, there's, most people come with um, female parts or male parts, but there's also a spectrum in between. Right. And so to understand that we are all on the spectrum and that I may at a particular point be more female or have more male characteristics that just frees you up from boxes. And I think once everybody recognizes that um, inclusiveness of just different kinds of people gets opened up. And I think that's a huge contribution of our Indian queer movement. Okay, the next one then is religion is predominantly misogynistic. What is the uh, what's your view on this? Are you an atheist? Somebody's asking. No, I'm not at all. I'm a, uh, I believe in sort of larger forces. I believe in connections between people and I believe in our connection with nature. And um, I suppose, I mean, I don't know what the word is. I meditate. Uh, I don't know what the word is, but I guess I would come closest to being a spiritual person. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. The next. Hey, one. Hey, can, I, can, I, can I jump in? Sorry. Please do. Um, so again, Karuna, going back to what we were mentioning briefly about the Black Lives Matter movement, which is started off US, it's going global. Not talking about that one specifically, but why have we not seen that kind of fight? Um, spread in India. So we've had very little impact on Black Lives Matter transferring to you know, Indian society and we have a lot of kind of prejudice um, here. So why have we not seen it kick off here? I think the closest to that would be Dalit Lives Matter 
And the reason that we don't have a sort of larger movement there is because the, the discriminations are much worse. You know, like people have really been ground into the dust in such a strong way that, um, that even a rising takes something. So we're, we're seeing something of that. And I think that it's an opportunity. I'm certainly not going to speak on Black Lives Matter. It is not my place. But um, I think for us, it is a duty to introspect and to look at what we are doing uh, in our blind privilege to expropriate the money, health, lives of Dalits. If you look at the migrants, for example, I think that our, our current health is an expropriation from their lives. You know, the fact that the lockdown, the lockdown benefited us and it took away from them. And so, and I, I'm making no bones about it because I now hear, see people talk about, and I have so much privilege, you know? Um, and the reason I think that a reckoning is important is because I now see people thinking of, uh, talking about privilege and saying, oh, but it's karma. No, it's not karma, you know? It's like what caste is, like your privilege, your money, your caste is karma. No, it is an expropriation. So I think uh, linking that, our privilege to directly to the disadvantage of others is, is important. Super. I'm going to just have to last change. question, Karuna. Someone, yeah. someone who wants to know, are you going to join, join politics at some point? No, <laughs> never. I mean, maybe in the far future, you know, yeah. never say never, but... Are all uh, the parties listening? She said never. I think she, she believes too much in ethics to join politics. This is the, you know, I mean, thank you for saying it, Vikas, because look, like, it's not that I haven't been asked. I have been asked and then I said, well, how would you fund it? And they said, well, you know, the party would finance it and, and that's my problem, campaign finance, right? Like there are quid pro quos. You, could, you, could start a, you could start a Karuna Cares Fund, see how that goes. <laughs> you know, I think that there's so much you can do. There's so much that you can do in court uh, and there's so much, well, in theory, uh, and there's so much that you can do otherwise. And there are people who have, who make their contributions in different places. And I think this is my place actually. Super. Thank you. So I think, I think that's, that, that was good. I'm glad you took on some questions voluntarily. People yeah. were getting pretty miffed that you're not going to answer questions. So no, because I also said come for a chat and I meant to chat. So I didn't mean <laughs> She meant for those listening, she meant to chat with us. Yes. <laughs> Lawyers, never trust lawyers. <laughs> never, never. Okay. Thanks, folks. This is really fun. This was fun. Right. Thank you, Karuna. You have a great Thanks day. Thanks so much, Karuna. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for watching. See you. Thanks. Bye.